All right. Let's see. Okay. So just want to welcome everybody. Appreciate everybody kind of jumping in here. Um, just to kind of lead off, there was a, a Reddit thread we started about a week and a half ago, just collecting questions from everybody um, on how um, everybody had questions about what we had in store for year two, um, anything really just burning on their minds. Um, what I think is actually really cool about Harvest Finance is it's like, it's pretty much like an AMA every day, right? 24 seven in our Discord mm -hmm. chat, we're, we're really so active. Um, the core devs try to be active as well too. But ultimately, sometimes questions get missed or there's just some really um, nuanced things that maybe people want to ask directly, right? People always love AMAs. Um, the thing is here, though, at Harvest Finance, the core devs are um, anonymous. So um, unfortunately, they can't appear on, on camera. Um, and we think it's much cooler to appear on camera than just posting like a wall of text for everybody um, to read like in Reddit or in chat. So uh, we just wanted to pull up here with everybody and kind of just read over um, the information that the core devs gave us. And then JB and myself um, will sprinkle in some kind of, kind of commentary along the way. And I guess maybe we'll switch off JB. We didn't really rehearse this, right? <laughs> so okay, I guess, we the sure, yeah, and, we, and we'll both comment on the questions or whatever, but I guess we can probably just cool. kind of uh, switch off. On and just quick, if anyone has any other questions that aren't being asked or are really burning, you can put them in the public chat, in the general channel on our Discord. And I think there may even be a chat box on YouTube, which I'm not looking at. So if someone does post a question there, please let us know that there's questions going in the YouTube uh, chat box. Yeah, for sure, for sure, good call. Um, so, okay, so again, all these questions really right now came from the Reddit. Um, we com consolidated some questions because there were some repeats or asking some of the same things or um, we just kind of uh, generalized the question. So um, again, I think we answered almost everybody's questions um, that was asked in here. Um, so really, I guess the biggest one is um, what are our objectives for year two um, of the protocol? So that would be the rest of 2021 and into 2022. Um, so what are the main goals for the year is decentralization, um, working towards equipping the community yeoman and builders, um, giving them more responsibility, and allowing more to happen um, without the, the core devs being a blocker. Um, this allows Harvest to become much more scalable in its operation. We've already seen fr fruitful results on this path, and we're happy to work together um, with the community on this. Um, so that was basically some direct feedback um, from the core developers. And this really goes along with, um, you know, the message that we've really been saying from day one. But now as we've kind of matured um, through the year, and actually been working towards decentralization, we want to continue to expand on that in 2022. Um, and this kind of ties to like the article I wrote um, recently that was talking about like um, DAOs actually needing to decentralize the O part um, of the DAO, the organization. Um, and through like the yeomans, as that was mentioned, or builders, um, these are all community filled roles within Harvest Finance. Um, so you know, community yeomen um, like Champaki or Grout, those guys are working on things like, you know, having communication with Ave for a potential listing, um, our deal with um, Bancor to get whitelisted and our two liquidity mining programs um, that came through like connections through Champaki and others in the community. So, um, you know, we're very much um, proud of our decentralizing the organization part and really relying on community people to help us build Harvest Finance. And that's what we want to continue um, in 2022, right? Like we don't, we just talked about we don't have a roadmap because things in decentralized finance are changing so quickly, but in a sense, we're also a very simple protocol, right? We want to offer the best yields and offer it simply to the user, right? So there's not much of a roadmap to do that other than new um, farms or new alpha or new products coming up, but we're not gonna know about those months down the line, right? Everything's just so free flowing in DeFi. Um, so for us, we're gonna again, rely on community builders or yeomen or stretch strategists to go out and find that alpha and continue, continuous, continually bringing it to us um, as we grow and expand into the year. So. Um, for us, again, just um, harping on what the the core devs was talking about, more decentralization. It's bringing more of you, everybody listening to this AMA, everybody in crypto sphere. We want you within the Harvest community because, again, you are our organization. 
So I'll start rambling yeah. there. Go ahead, JP. Cool. I just wanted to jump in on what you said about uh, we want to make sure that the devs are no longer a blocker. I just want to kind of clarify that for people. So the developers, by being anonymous, they kind of pull themselves out of, uh, in, a, in a sense, like direct accountability, right? They're obviously, you know, benevolent people. They want the best for what we're doing, hence why Harvest is such a great success. But they are you know they are decentralized they are anonymous and what we want is they're not a blocker in that sense what we want is to just be an independent decentralized community where we have the ability to go ahead and make all the decisions we want to make without any input from the developers they on the other hand what they want is basically in tandem with what we want they want to be able to sit and work hard and create the best strategies with the best code at you know the quickest rates as they've been doing for the past year just without having to deal with the responsibility of kind of organizing the community, which as you know, the discord of harvest has about 12,000 people in it, at least at the moment. And it's not just 12,000 people who are interested in the project. It's 12,000 people. Well, let's say a thousand people who are directly contributing to us and like to organize that as one man who is in the background of back end developer or front end developer whilst maintaining your anonymity. It's not really what they envisage. And this is what we're doing right now is exactly what they've been saying since day one. There's a, uh, an internal sort of channel that has the founding principles. And one of those is to decentralize and to reduce the amount of individual workload as much as possible so we can flourish without there being any kind of blocking from a centralized force. Yeah, and I think what's really cool um, is, you know, like part of um, Harvest Tokenomics um, sets aside um, operational fund, right? And from that operational fund, a chunk of that actually flows into a community controlled multi-sig. Um, so we actually have like decentralized uh, operational funds that are not directly controlled 100% um, by the developers. And that's what helps us pay um, like the month to month bills um, within the community, whether it's, you know, whether our, our PR partners for marketing or, you know, some of the people that are doing uh, contractual work for us internally, artists, like all this stuff. Right. And so, um, as you mentioned, without needing to say like, oh, hey, developer, I need X amount of money and please approve this and blah, blah, blah. We actually have a multi sig. And we just kind of say, hey, here's our request. And those things happen within like a few minutes. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so this allows, again, like you were saying, the developers to focus, you know, purely on development rolling out the best products uh, because people don't understand like uh, this is like the tip of the iceberg theory again I mentioned this in the article that I wrote um, everybody just sees the product which is the tip of the iceberg and they say oh how this is so cool oh wow DAO because I can vote but the majority of the iceberg the majority of the organization is underwater and nobody really thinks about all these things that you need to actually accomplish as a business to be successful right especially when you're managing 16,000 people of a community like who's doing the customer service who's updating the guides you know who's doing marketing like all these things that need to be done that just aren't programming and like you said one guy or three guys the developers they can't necessarily handle all of that and if you truly want to be decentralized you need to hand off all those responsibilities Responsibilities um, outside and it's also of the, the global online aspect of the whole thing. There's no contracts involved. You know, it's it, the whole point in what we're doing right now is that we're breaking the norms in terms of kind of how you function as a as a group, as a working group, right? So without legal contractual obligations, without you know working hours as set like that, it's all it's the fact that it works so well and it doesn't kind of just like disappear is, is, is amazing. And it's kind of testament to what DeFi is trying to achieve, right? It's trying to achieve removal from the corporate structure and showing that it still works. Everyone says, oh, you know, if you don't have a work, uh, if you don't have a contract or you don't have your working hours then you'll just stay in bed and be lazy. And this is a testament to how that is just not the case, right? People are motivated. Intrinsic motivation is huge in DeFi. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, just to tie off that question, we kind of spent a lot of time on that one. So that's the objectives for year two is just, you know, uh, making sure we're still putting out the best, um, most pr uh, productive um, strategies for our users, and then also putting the power into the user's hands that if you want to become part of this DAO, become part of this organization, um, you're fully, freely able to do that. Um, so you're up, JB. Cool. Uh, so someone, another question we had is, I'm wondering what your take is on Coinbase seemingly being behind your true price whenever farm pumps uh, as well. Is that put them putting farm on trending in order to, I'm assuming, manipulate the market? Uh, the short answer is no. Okay, so Coinbase is another market on its own. It's not, 
it's not connected to the price of Uniswap, for example, it's its own contained market. Uh, so therefore the price will be just reflective of what their own market price is. Uh, the delay would be a reflection of people arbitraging between the Coinbase market and the markets on Bancor and Uniswap. So for example, if someone buys a lot on Coinbase, then the Coinbase price will go up. The Uniswap, Bancor, other pools are not affected. However, some savvy you know, traders will see the arbitrage opportunity there, and then they will make the trades in order to even out the overall price. But it, it is a self-contained market on Coinbase because it's a CEX. It's a good question, but like, uh, it, that's just how markets are working at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, and just randomly, like any any question on price, right? Like we actually pull, like pull ourselves a lot away from the, like price conversations um, within the token, because um, those are things that we can't control either, right? Like as you said, like Coinbase is its own entity. Then you have all these other decentralized markets, and then you have Binance as well. Um, so there's just too many things that can go on um, into market pricing. Um, ultimately, what I always like to point back to is like we're different than like 95% of other tokens in that regardless of what the market gives us valuation, because there's a revenue, like fees, a fee revenue stream connected into the farm token. Like it's, it's generating you, um, you know, this revenue stream, even if the market is down temporarily, you're still collecting on that coin if staked, as opposed to other token, most other tokens, you're kind of just at the free whim of the market. Right. So like, um, for us, like I always feel uncomfortable just talking about pricing or questions like these specifically. Um, I always like to point back to is just like, you know, whatever the, regardless of whatever's happening in these markets, um, our coin or the, the farm token has um, intrinsic value. Um, and that's one of like the more important things that you should be like focusing on as, as opposed to like short-term swings in the market, right? For sure, for sure. Uh, something I actually just quickly add, the Bancor, the buyback mechanism for uh, the farm token has been switched to Bancor and that will have its own kind of pricing effect on the market within Bancor itself. That doesn't apply to Coinbase and no longer applies to Uniswap, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so that will have its own kind of pushing up effect of the price, the floor price on the bank or pools. So that's just something to be mindful of. Not that it will, you know, the arbitrages will get there first, most likely, because they know what they're doing, but just something to be wary of. All right, next question. Um, a common theme of gripe in the community, um, marketing plus front end UI improvements. Do the devs plan on allocating funds or continue to increase the funds allocated to build out the team to help promote, promote harvest and everything it stands for? Um, so from the devs, we have marketing funds allocated and it's being managed by the community. There are wonderful people working in marketing and we believe in the results. We're open to front end UI improvements work. However, website maintenance is not a, not a one off work it requires ongoing maintenance by good developers. Um, as we push out new vaults and make updates to these contracts, getting a long term community dev is a challenge and we're actively looking for more JavaScript developers to contribute to our API repo, as well as consider building a community run version of the front end. So that was kind of a mouthful. Um, so basically, let's, uh, let's take a step back. So there's two parts of the question, um, you know, are we going to quote, unquote, improve marketing, um, would be the first part of the question. Um, I actually think within the past like month and a half, um, our marketing has actually taken like a really dramatic improvement um, in terms of yeah, big up to Jeff Z. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Jeff Z is damn, stealing my thunder, bro. I'm trying. I'm trying to give him props yeah, and you're I'm jumping all over me. <laughs> yeah, saying, yeah. Just Jeff Z is a stud. Uh, we brought him on um, over from uh, another group that Harvest was really uh, closely tied to. Um, so he's been loving Harvest um, from day one and is with, within the past like two months, um, we brought him on board <clears throat> really just to help us out with a couple different things, whether it's like visually graphics or some of the medium articles. Um, he's really taken the, the bull by the horns there and, and just really improved like kind of like our base layer uh, marketing or at least how we represent ourselves like a meeting him to Twitter. Um, and then the other thing that we've also done too is just like really focused internally as a community. Um, for instance, like when V2 uh, was launching, we kind of had like these two weeks of a bunch of really st cool stuff coming out. And then we, um, which led up to ECC in Paris, right? So pretty much for like the past month, um, 
we've been actually really pushing our marketing um, again, doing articles, doing live screen, uh, live streams, working with our PR partner, um, Yap Global, who were amazing, hooked us up with a bunch of interviews and meeting with a, a, a bunch of different people uh, at ECC, right? So there is a bunch of marketing actually being done. Um, mm -hmm. I, I had an interview with somebody from Business Insider, right? Um, so it's not... So people just want to see marketing like what do you want to see banners or flashing lights or sirens we're giving away teslas like that's not harvest right like we've never done that we're organic community grown um, we rely on everybody in a sense to kind of help us do our marketing whether it's word of mouth uh, because i've never clicked a banner i've seen on coin market cap or coin gecko or anywhere right like to me when i see something flashing and saying click here ten thousand percent returns like to me, like that's a scam, right? And I, I would think of that like it was mm -hmm. a waste of money. Uh, what we try to do is instead we give money to Gitcoin grants, right? Fifty thousand dollars that we just did to actually fund the ecosystem, right? That's great, effective marketing um, in my mind, and doing things organically um, to better the things around us, as opposed to just trying to pat ourselves on the back and, and try to get more TVL in here, right? Um, we try to collaborate with these other projects that are building great things within the space. And that's how we try to do our marketing and true connections and collaborating, right? So for me, um, I think we're doing a great job um, in this respect. Um, and maybe if you were here like six months ago, um, uh, you know, I may like agree with you in a sense that we, we should probably be working um, a lot more strongly on this front. But since like leading into V2 and since then, I think we've done an amazing job. And it's, it's pointing out these community members that we brought, us, brought on to help us. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything on that front, JB. Yeah, I, th I think it's just something that everyone, everyone should be really aware that we are in an echo chamber, right? The crypto world is what, 20 million DeFi users maximum? um and yeah just in fact that comment that just went in the chat, chat now it says please improve marketing sir is such a padgy thing to say yeah it really really is what what that means is i want my price of my token to go up and i have no conceivable way of doing that so i'm just going to say sir when marketing like it is it is a it's not what you'd expect in terms of like if we were a shit coin then yeah getting some pump signals would be fine but that's not what we're about we're about you know, genuine growth, sticky TVL. Sticky TVL is like the buzzword, right? It's money that comes and stays because they like what we're doing and they like what we're about. And organic marketing, things like interviews, things like, you know, partnerships, that's how we should do it. Um, I just want to quickly touch on the front end thing. The key part of that is front end requires ongoing maintenance, right? So some things are great ideas wise but like they do require ongoing maintenance they are hooked up to all of our strategies so one thing that we're kind of big on is if you have an idea for a front end and it's something you want to implement build it let us know we'll send you a grant for it it just has to be something that is easily maintainable right that's what it is yeah um and, and the devs mentioned so there is something brewing on this front um within you know, like us core community managers and yeoman and, and gardeners, all the work roles kind of having internal discussions. Now that the devs, um, as mentioned in this answer, um, they've kind of opened up the front end to allow um, a community built and managed interface to connect to the harvest. And um, so we're actually trying to seek developers um, that are good with UX. So if there's anybody out there sitting out there who wants to submit their portfolio, please do. Um, so we can kind of have like a landing page or um, some kind of um, interface that like we want to call sexy, right? Because it's kind of like with marketing, right? Like if you're not doing all this flashy stuff, if you don't have some crazy, you know, um, web page with all these like buzz lights and like it looks super cool and edgy, then people say you need front end improvements, right? But you know, like our focus again is ultimately we want to be this one click solution where people can just click, click, and I'm, I'm now earning money. And you don't need this fancy looking website with, you know, things moving around and blah, 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 blah. You know, these are all these things that are that fool people to trying to attract like the liquidity locusts. But as soon as your farming ends, all those people are gone, right? And I think what's actually really cool is that Harvest has been able to maintain like very steady $500 million, you know, respectable TVL, 
even when there's so many other fancy projects like shouting, you know, hey, look at our APYs, right? So um, yeah. as opposed to just w worrying about these front end UI improvements, you know, really look at the things that we're rolling out that are truly valuable to the end user, right? Uh, but again, to answer the question, yes, there is work being going, put on into this. Uh, we're definitely working on um, both of these aspects continuously. Front end is kind of just very new in the sense that um, this is going to be kind of community opened up. And so we're kind of doing some progressive work on this, but it's still too early to really talk about. Okay, okay so this marketing question leads into our next question in a way. Um, firstly, let's not mention nationalities in the chat area, please. We want to be an inclusive place for all of our DeFi farmers. Um, but yeah, so the next question is, someone says, would you mind doing a deep dive into iFarm? iFarm is such a cool token, but I've got to admit that I don't fully understand the mechanism by which the value or the interest is imbued and then maintained. Is it tied to the farm token at all or uh, as in? farm value plus the backing of profits or is it a completely separate entity and if so what are the mechanics that holds the interest so just relating to the last question something like this for example is something that we can improve on in terms of you know quote unquote marketing quote unquote front end okay this would be how we explain to people how we demonstrate what ifarm is and kind of ask all answer all of these questions in a on the interface as they turn up at the website right that's kind of the sort of marketing that we want to be interested in is making things very, very easy for the user. That in a way is a very effective marketing, right? So to answer the question, basically iFarm is a vault for farm. So you deposit your farm into the profit sharing pool on the front page and your iFarm is a deposit signifier for that vault deposit. What that means is the profit sharing pool that increases the amount of farm that you have, currently I think it's 35% APY, that that interest that you're earning is represented by your iFarm token. So right now, one iFarm, I think, equals maybe 1.15 farm. When iFarm was first released, it was one iFarm equals one farm. So when you deposit your farm into the profit sharing pool, you're given a signifier of that. Your farm underlying in the vault continues to earn interest and continues to compound, which is the profit sharing mechanic. And then your iFarm is a signifier that you can go and use somewhere else whilst you're earning that APY percentage. So for example, collateralization through Fcash, for example, on the uh, on the homepage. And so yeah, it is intrinsically tied to farm. It is a separate token and it can be transferred separately. But if you want to get your farm out from that profit sharing pool, you have to then deposit again your iFarm. That is your key to get your farm out. And farm is the one with the deepest liquidity pools. So if you're you know trading a lot of farm, for example, you're going to need to get that iFarm back to get your farm out to sell for a good price. You can sell iFarm on the secondary market, but our primary liquidity is in the farm token. So that's why you need your iFarm to get it back out. Um, the profit sharing mechanic, for those that don't know, is 30% of all of the profits that our strategy makes is used to buy back farm from the market. That farm that we have bought is then redistributed to the profit sharing pool. So you're earning you're earning the 30% profit worth of farm into the pool. And also the buybacks are creating a rising price floor for the farm token, which is dope for everyone. Um, so yeah, as long as there's a uh, harvest in our vaults, there will be interest in iFarm. As long as we are still doing our strategies, farm will be earning an APY in the profit sharing pool. Uh, so I'm just going to Unless you have anything to say, Red, I was going to go on to the collateral bit because it's completely No, insane. I mean, I was just going to say a quick ELI-5 of that is basically um, iFarm means interest bearing farm. So deposit your farm, it starts collecting interest. iFarm is your receipt for that. And then you can actually use that receipt at other projects to deposit while you're still earning your interest at harvest. And then as you mentioned, um, where that interest comes from is there's a, over 140 different strategies at harvest farming and making money. A percentage of the profit is taken and sent to that profit share. So that's where the interest comes from, right? So um, just very simple, interest bearing farm, you're collecting interest on your farm when you deposit it. Yeah, cool. Um, so I just, on as it's related, no, I'll just do this one. Uh, so it's, what are the plans to expand protocols that will accept it as collateral? It's, we're talking about iFarm here. 
Uh, so recently we launched the Fcash like system, which allows you to borrow your assets using iFarm as collateral. So you deposit your iFarm into it as collateral and you can withdraw uh, FUSDC, which is a USDC derivative from Harvest. Uh, also the Fuse pool now allows you to use either iFarm or Farm as collateral uh, on Rari Capital, for example. And you can go there and you can deposit your iFarm and Farm and you can use it as collateral to borrow against it. Aave and Cream are on the list. Aave is, of course, on the top of the list, but we are currently at proposal stage at the moment. These are essentially only community-driven efforts, and so we encourage you guys all to, if you have connections in Aave or you have lobbying power somewhere else, to basically push that agenda. We want Aave listing, and of course, of course, Aave and also Cream would be good. Uh... Yeah, um, if I can give a, a small shill here is actually one of the things I'm trying to set up for iFarm or farm itself is over at uh, Complify. Um, Complify is like a derivatives AMM. So you can like buy 5x leverage on like Ethereum or BTC um, up or down leverage, but there's no um, liquidation for forced liquidations or margin calls. So like even if the price crashes below your price point, um, your holding just goes to zero, right? You don't have somebody coming looking for you um, for any like um, collateralization uh, because it flash crashed too quickly or whatever, right? Um, so one of the things that we're looking to do is get um, Farm or iFarm added there um, they're in their options portfolio. Um, and they're called covered call options, which is basically, it's pretty simple for the user. Um, let's say you wanted to buy an option on Farm. There's a predetermined price, so Farm's $200 today maybe the predetermined price is $225. So to buy an option is to say, I'm buying all profits on farm if it goes above $225. So a farm shoots up to 350, you've now collected over $175 or, or whatever it is the difference is um, because you bought an option on all that profit, right? So. Um, they offer options like on Ethereum, Bitcoin, uh, Matic. So like, again, if you think Ethereum is going to pump like crazy during the next two weeks, you go buy an option on Ethereum. And in a sense, you could have unlimited profit. If Ethereum suddenly ran from 3000 to 6000 over the next two weeks, you would literally have a ticket to all of that $3,000 gains as an option. So the same thing would apply to farm. Um, you go buy that option on farm. You think farm's going to run here in the next couple of weeks because of all the cool things that are coming out of Harvest Finance. You could buy an option for like literally like 20 bucks. And then if farm does go wild, you could collect, you know, like I was saying, and like Ethereum options were like $150 when they first opened. And then they were shoot, it would, Ethereum shot up to $4,000 from 3,200. So you were collecting, you know, a net $700 there or something roughly like that, right? So just something very cool option that you could do with um, iFarm. And because iFarm is continuously interest bearing, you're still in the profit share, collecting your revenue stream from Harvest. And then you can go and deposit it at some place like Complify and either earn trading fees or you can buy the options themselves and kind of just have these other degenerate ways to like still play with your, your farm tokens while still making interest. So as you're kind of saying, JB though, but those things come from the community going out and saying like, where can we use these interest bearing tokens at? Who accepts interest bearing tokens? Like HG Wine Finance is another cool one that we've connected with that does interest bearing yeah. tokens, um, an Aave or whatever it is. But all of these things, we need your help in the community because there's so many projects that pop up and I'm like, I haven't even heard of this before. And, you know, like I can't keep up with the stuff and I work in here 24 seven. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, just not to continue to go on this, but we just really need the community specifically in this aspect to to help us grow um, and find more uses for iFarm. Can I just jump in there? Um, two things. Firstly, Omar, you said make a YouTube channel in Arabic language that will grow the community. So we have already I don't know if you've seen we have uh, it's the cultivator role, right? Is that what it is? Yeah. So we have a lot of roles for the community and cultivator is what we call basically the translators, like the people who take our content and make it into a foreign language. Uh, there are grants available for all of those works. Uh, so if, for example, you, you yourself or someone you know is able to make Arabic language 
content, like be it medium posts or just translations or even an entire video explaining it, that's the sort of thing that you can apply to us for a grant and we can give you a grant for that. Like the whole point in the cultivator role is for people to take the initiative to want it in their language, to show it to their, you know, their compatriots and then get money for it. So Omar, either yourself or any of your friends, you can do that. And also, I don't know, any Turkish people listening, Turkey is a market we would love to be involved in. Uh, and one more thing, it was uh, update on grain. Hopefully we'll come to that. If not, I'll let you know at the end. Okay. Cool. Um, let me see. Oh, this is me, huh? I was just talking for so long, man. I ramble. You got to cut me off sometimes. <laughs> oh, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is the ETA on the mobile friendly UI for the new Harvest site? Not being able to access it on the go is as fun as bucking hay. Nice uh, little uh, analogy there, right? Um, actually, so our mobile UX, for those of you who don't know, has been completely revamped and released. Um, it's actually like a true mobile site now. I think before it was just kind of like a scaled down version of the, the full UX. But I think now it's actually like a truly full mobile site, um, a lot easier for people to use. So um, we definitely like all of your feedback on that. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to say on that, JB, but it's out. Please use it. Yeah, uh, it's it's big, big news for us in terms of our Southeast Asian uh, market because they're pretty much mostly uh, phone users. And I think you're going to see a large TVL increase from our Chinese compadres because we have BBCat, who is fantastic over there doing some great stuff. Um, there was a question there. Can you please talk about any regulations issues that you may be worried? Kish, remind us at the end and we'll, we'll do that. Okay, so the next one is... Is there any plans to offer staking directly from the Coinbase dashboard? And if so, what is the timeline? So currently Binance staking is live and I'm going to post a little link for you so you can go ahead and head there. Uh, and it was driven and made entirely possible by our community. So it wasn't, you know, an internal display. It was internal to an extent, but we had community members come in and make those connections with Binance, make the headway. We got AMAs out of it. We got a Binance listing on BSC. And now we can even stake farm directly on Binance, which is huge exposure for us. So if you're interested in making that Coinbase connection, try and find some people. We've got some contacts, we're working on it, but the more the merrier, and that's kind of what it is. It's all about the pressure. It's all about the, for them, it's a selling point, right? So if they let uh, harvest, sorry, they let farm be staked on Coinbase, they're doing that because they know that we have a great community with a big following who are then gonna go and use Coinbase. Like it's all it's all self-interest. So if we show them that we have the community and everybody wants it, then they'll do it because they'll get whatever, some additional deposits and a couple percent on your fees. Uh, so there's that. Do you want to go do the uh, integration with Aave? Uh, well, we can we just touch that one real quick. It's kind of a short answer. Um, in the sense with like integration with Aave or integration with Cream or any of the, these other protocols, like specifically Aave, um, you know, it's pretty much fully decentralized in terms of how you become listed on Aave. So um, we are going through the, the steps to do that. Um, it just took a little while because we, you know, one of the main things was getting like a, a chain link price feed. Um, and that actually took um, getting listed on a centralized exchange, but getting on, listed on these big um, exchanges like Coinbase um, and Binance. Um, specifically like Coinbase, I don't know if many people realize, I think we're one of the first, if not just like the second, I'm pretty sure we're the first, so like fully Anon core dev team to be listed on Coinbase, and like a, a major exchange like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so to, to accomplish that, right, like a lot of these uh, places, they want like oh, a legal opinion or, or, you know, just some kind of, uh, where are you incorporated at? But, you know, we, we live on Ethereum, right? And we're a bunch of random knuckleheads who help out, you know, in um, this Discord and the developers are fully unon. So how, you know, how it's much more difficult, right, to get onto these exchanges. So it took us a little while to get us like that chain link feed to make sure we had stable prices on farm. And then so that's a requirement for Aave. So we actually just overcame that hurdle within the past like 60 days, um, right? And so now we've overcome that hurdle. We're actually reworking on our proposal to Aave. And so we'll hopefully have that here. Again, I don't want to give any timeline, but just relatively soon in the sense that it's something we are focused on. Um, so do you think that the way Harvest is structured with community run projects and partnerships is the best way to decentralize? This is a really good question. It is uh, existential to not just Harvest, but basically most of DeFi, right? 
what is the best way to decentralize and you should go and read uh red's amazing piece on DAOs because kind of goes through some of the problems that people well projects are facing right now with decentralization it's it's a big one especially with all the regulations coming in um so the current structure has enabled a lot of things for harvest the examples of what we've done so far include the fcash the fuse pools Binance and Coinbase listings, as well as like strategy in, in, integrations such as Stakewise, the balance of pools, Idle, Convex, huge names. And, you know, for example, the Bancor whitelisting proposals that have just gone live, uh, just been passed. We've got a big APY there. It's one of their largest volume pools, you know, for a token that's not a, sta a stable coin or not a top three. That's pretty impressive. Uh, we do encourage more contributions to our open source repositories, as well as building more exclusively community driven integrations and developments. So, for example, different UI versions for different people, you know, you can imagine one for a Arabic audience, for example, as Omar was saying. That, can kind of, that kind of thing can be commissioned by us, but developed by the community. Uh, any other suggestions that you can think of in terms of decentralization are welcome, but we personally feel like the system that we have at the moment is pretty solid. Uh, we're producing some really lovely things and it is all decentralized operations, right? Some of the things have come, some of the ideas have come from the developers, but I would say 90% of them, especially the last ones in the last six months or so, have all come from the community, from interested party members. And it's just, it's really fantastic to see what we can come up with together, despite having no real life connections to each other. Like we're global, we have no idea who we are. Half the people are avatars, right? Red is a monkey. So, you know, it's um, it's just really great. I, there are other ways to decentralize for sure, but I think also it's also important to know that decentralization is a learning process for everyone right now, right? Like I can't think of one or two projects that have got it correctly. So we're all learning. Any suggestions are helpful. So I, let's just keep learning what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, and I agree with everything. We, we kind of talked about this earlier. You know, we're not perfect in it, right? Like there's probably other things that we could decentralize um, a little bit more. Uh, but uh, going back to, you know, the O and DAOs, the organization, right? I think this is like an area that we're excelling at in terms of um, decentralization, right? Because um, there is so many things like, again, the multi-sig and us making these day-to-day -day decisions, whether it's like, you know, the, the marketing guy is asking for, you know, $5,000 to produce a video, right? Um, you know, or we need to pay our, our PR partner, or we've got, uh, we need to send some rewards over to this vault based on an agreement we made um, with this other collaboration. All those things are literally be done by community members, right? Devs have nothing to do with this stuff. Um, again, not to say, they're, they're cut out completely. They over kind of see this stuff. They can step at any time, but they're letting us run these day-to-day -day operations and make these decisions. Um, you know, anything that's not really requiring the implementation of like your code, for instance, or something that can create um, a security issue, um, they ultimately let us handle, right? So, you know, that is, you know, decentralizing your organization um, and speaking to directly some of the things like uh, the SEC was talking about or if it's just the same five people that launch the protocol or making every single business decision, you're not decentralized, you're not a DAO, right? So um, again, I just think in this respect, Harvest is uh, you know probably one of the leaders um, in terms of like a larger one-year-old kind of um, DAO structure and actually decentralizing the organization part. Um, and this is a, a really a credit to, you know, the yeoman, I've mentioned some of the names, you know, Champaki, Grout, EA Sports, Absolute Unit, like these are guys here every single day and they have like their own jobs, full-time jobs or whatever it is, but they're here every single day, kicking the can, like, Hey, let's fill out these documents, whether they're doing like the Ave arc, um, whether they're talking to, um, Bancor and pushing through now our second liquidity mining proposal, um, that just cleared within the past week. Um, F cash, like all of these things are done by just dudes like me sitting in their home office, trying to figure out like some of the best things um, that can be accomplished. And I don't have like a contract with Harvest Finance. I don't have deliverables. Like this is just like completely day to day shape shifting. What can we do for the best of the protocol, for the best of the community? And anybody can be a part of that, right? Anybody listening, you know, that has a motivation that truly wants to be a part of something awesome and not just here for like a paycheck, um, this is the place for you, right? So uh, 
I'll, you know, I'll start, stop rambling again here, but this is like one of the parts that I'm most passionate about is our community and decentralizing this aspect um, of crypto, because that's what's so important um, in a DAO, right? Decentralized autonomous organization, right? The mm -hmm. organization needs to be decentralized. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I'm just going to go to the uh, chat box because there's a few questions. Uh, Kish, your question about the delay on withdrawals from Coinbase. I'm afraid that you've got to take that up with my man Brian. <laughs> we have we have no bearing on that, sadly. Um, Crypto Sniper, any plans plans to launch a Harvest Dex to become a one stop shop? Well, if you have been listening in on some of our previous uh, community calls, you, you probably have heard BB talking about basically Harvest becoming a conglomerate with sub brands that are related to Harvest. That is something he's very interested in personally, and I know there's a, quite a lot of interest in the community and within internal. I'm not going to say anything. We have a name for it, but I don't know if it's going to come out. But um, so that's that's that. Just to say, BB's idea is to create a huge ecosystem, right? That's what he wants, and we're working towards that pretty rapidly, actually. Uh, Frank, I don't know what question you're referring to, but if you're referring to NFTs and their future value valuation. Two things that are important. Firstly, NFTs are, well, the ones that we've released are with no guarantee of future value increase. So be careful when you buy NFTs in general. However, we have some plans lined up for incentivization of some NFTs that have been released by Harvest. So, you know, just be careful with what you do. Um, that is the questions for now, right? Right. Moving on. All right. Yeah, we got to pick up the pace a little bit here too. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna break out here. So um, we're gonna pick up the pace a little bit. Just read through some of these a little bit more quickly. Um, again, I think we've actually gone through the meteor uh, questions in here. So um, really, this one's asking if there's any use case for Harvest once ETH upgrades to 2.0. Most of the selling point now is gas savings auto count compounding, um, but when half is gone and the other could potentially be done cheaper. Um, what do you expect will happen? And is there any way for yield aggregators to buy profitability on other chains and save more on other chains, save more advanced strategies? Uh, so grammar's a little weird on that one. But ultimately, the question is, um, you know, supposedly when ETH upgrades, uh, will Harvest still be able to hang around? Um, but the answer is really, ultimately, it's not perfectly clear if ETH 2.0 is going to drastically reduce um, gas costs. Um, and we go just beyond gas savings. Um, we're, we're strategy management. We help discover new high yield protocols. Um, we offer um, services like for like Uni V3 um, vaults to like stablecoin projects that don't want to necessarily actively manage those strategies themselves. Um, so there are various services that we can um, offer. And gas has always like historically been up, down, up, down, right? Like right now it's relatively cheap, surprisingly, right? Like in the, the low 70s or whatever it was this morning, instead of, you know, 6,000, depending on some kind of NFT war that's going on. Um, I think the other thing too is uh, um, harvest is kind of like almost like a safe haven because there are a bunch of farms out there in the wild, but it's hard to understand if they're safe. Um, unless you're using somebody else's third party tool who's kind of validated that it's safe, right? Um, but like with Harvest, we are so conscientious, especially since the hack, you know, like eight, 10 months ago now, um, that we're just not going to deploy anything without like tenfold checks and making sure it's perfect, right? So um, for us, when you see something pop up on strategy, we feel confident uh, that it's safe. Um, so you can kind of know. You know, instead of being out there in the wild and jumping from all these random APYs, why not just be safe and making that consistent money and never have to worry about a rug pull, right? I think um, that's another thing that Harvest actually offers beyond just, oh, we're, we're saving you some gas in these wild Ethereum times. Anything else, JB? Still with me? Uh-oh, I think we lost JB. Oh, no. All right. Um, so I'm going to jump to the next one because I don't know what happened to JB. Uh, yields on stables on BSC were nobly higher a few weeks ago, um, both in terms of APY of the underlying and the farm rewards. Why have both come off? Was it a just case of you subsidizing for early entrance after the new layout? Uh, the devs have said there's no significant change on our BS BSC side. Um, the APY of the underlying would only be related to the external pools 
and our farm rewards are distributed based on the profitability of the vaults. Oh, there's JP. Um, so ultimately on this question, um, you know, no, we don't overly um, incentivize vaults just to like attract people in. Uh, we've never been by that. And that's the way that platforms actually lose a lot of profitability, right? When you see these like 100,000 APY farms or these new projects um, starting up, um, they're purposely just mass ejecting these wars to get your attention and to get you over there. Um, whereas Harvest is just very focused on long-term um, sustainability and profitability of the protocol. So we don't um, just mass eject um, rewards to attract people into it. Um, we actually set rewards to those strategies based on um, what we think is a good TBL for that specific strategy. Uh, Oh, yep. Sure. Let me add you back in there, buddy. All right. Pop him back in there. Uh, what are your expansion plans for other protocols on BSC and Polygon? I see lots of exciting projects that lacked optimizers, auto compounders, um, Doppel, Alpaca, even further ellipsis funds. Are you expanding more uh, or adding further protocols over additional, adding additional chains? Um, so basically, we're still expanding on Polygon. I think we should probably have some cool stuff here in the next couple of weeks. I don't want to make any promises, but we have a really awesome community-based um, developer, Jasper, who kind of helps build all the, the strategies. All the alpha comes in from the community. Um, Jasper intakes it, kind of looks it over, makes sure it's going to be a, a vault or a strategy that will be around for like more than a couple of days. Right. Um, we don't want to be programming for a week and then all of a sudden a farm go poof. Um, we want to make sure they're going to hang out for a while. So Jasper goes through all those details and then kind of delivers to the devs and the devs do a bunch of other safety checks to make sure, um, you know, these are actually good strategies. Will they be profitable strategies? Um, you know, the questions about like other chains. Um, it just really depends on whether those other chains have like long term holding power and if there's value proposition um, for an aggregator to go over there. Um, it takes a lot of upkeep time um, and keeping an eye on security when you're adding additional chains. Um, so we have to be like very careful when we're deploying these uh, because additionally too on other chains, the profit margin um, just isn't high for aggregators because of the low costs that are occurring on those chains. Um, so again, for us at, at Harvest, it sounds like we see as most people see the majority development occurring on Ethereum and a lot of these other things that are happening on like layer twos or other protocols are just like liquidity locust stuff. And we're just not quite confident that those places necessarily have the staying power for an aggregator to be developed and deployed there full time. Um, and we've seen many instances like on BSC, for instance, people are saying, hey, why haven't you rolled out the strategy? Hey, why don't you roll this out strategy? And I swear, like more than half the time people ask that question within a week or two. And this was like when BSC was having a, some issues, they were, those projects were getting hacked. And I'm just like, see, this is why we don't roll out stuff just because there's some giant APY and let's go get the profit. Like safety is just so important. And, the, you know, the hack that happened so long ago, that is still something that really bothers us. Um, and we want to make sure never, never happens again, right? So um, it's just not about all of the APY figures and generating a profit. Let's make sure we're doing this simply and as safely so everybody, anybody can enjoy profits, um, whether it's like simply a, a basic strategy or like a multi-tiered kind of advanced strategy. We try to make that easy for everybody. And that's more important than trying to find the next 100,000 APY. Cool. Uh, that kind of leads into the next question. I'm just going to quickly run through the next two, if that's all right, Red. Um, so yep. the first one is, what keeps the developers up at night, worrying about upstream problems or worrying about harvest specific components and points of failure? So look, uh, based on what Red just said, we spend a lot of time reviewing the line approaches that we choose for future strategies, right? There's a real, uh, really tight, strict criteria for these things, okay? Because we choose to de deploy strategies that have that don't have the risk of rug pulls or impermanent loss issues, which Red just described, right? If you have hundreds of thousands of percent APY, there's potentially a catch there. Um, however, contract flaws, as we've seen, can arise anywhere, even the most, you know, quote unquote, secure security. So it does keep us busy, but 
is DeFi, right? It's the Wild West, which is why it's so much fun and potentially so much profit. Okay, so the next question, uh, which is what we kind of address, but I'll speak to you again because Frank has been hilarious. So the NFTs, right? What it, the question is, will the recently released NFTs have any other use other than art? So the question, we, the answer we prepared is like the NFT was an amazing effort entirely driven by the community without any centralized involvement. The community themselves could decide and build additional use cases for those NFTs. So just for an example of what we've decided, what we discussed internally is there's so much great art being uh, submitted to us at Harvest, especially with the community, the creative community compost. That kind of art, some of them are NFT worthy. If you can imagine we have a would-be designer who wants to get their work out of there, uh, out there into the, you know, into the ether, uh, but doesn't know, like, it doesn't have like a, a community to do that. We could use the NFTs as like a distribution point and say, look, community art, here it is minted on the blockchain and we're going to distribute it to the existing NFT holders. That's people with an interest in Harvest. That's the people with an interest in NFTs. And that's a, that right, that, that right there is a ready made audience for the, you know, for the artists that want to get their work out there. That's just an example. You can imagine being a holder of one of a particular type of NFTs and receiving a bunch of free NFTs from someone who wants to utilize that resource. That's just one example looking into and community members are looking into such as staking, classification, these sorts of things. Um, moving on, actually whilst my laptop might die, so I'm going to go at some point to get my charger, but <laughs> sorry, but I do want to address uh, who was it just saying about the Kish, about the regulatory issues, right? So you said regulatory issues, KYC, security classification, stable coins, etc. right? So all of that un is an umbrella of regulation. And right now, everybody unfortunately is following the lead of Gary Gensler and the SEC in the US, right? And they are making it very, very clear that A, they don't really understand DeFi and B, they have no intention of making it about protection for the user. They have it basically about protection for the institutions, protection for their monopoly on interest bearing protocols, right? We don't want to comply with that. We don't want to abide by that structure if we don't have to so it becomes some really is an existential threat to harvest we will just continue our DeFi operations as as we can and that is although some people were a bit unhappy with the anonymous developers that is exactly why they did it right they can now operate continue to build without fear while some docs developers for example might have to cease operations we don't we can keep building we can keep innovating and that is the benefit of this decentralized community aspect. And, you know, we are decentralized. We are some of the provably some of the best, like the most decentralized protocol out there. And that is going to hold us up well if we are going to be facing any kind of security classification. Stable coins, that is a separate issue. I would recommend you go look into that in a separate way. But stable coins, I think, are here to stay. I would look at partially collateralized ones as well, something like Frax Finance. They're really good, something to look into as well. Um, yeah, and that kind of leads into um, the other question. Um, we only have like three more questions here. So um, I would like to know if the devs are ever considering to move from anon to at least a semi anon status, um, if this would be for the greater good of harvest. Um, so again, just kind of touching back on what JB was saying there. But the, the question is, is, or the answer is basically from the devs is being anon is an experiment. We want to show that there is no need for a real world identity to enable trust as we've started with no social capital and we now have a community and well-established relationship in the whole space, we're continuing on this path to demonstrate that this is possible. Um, so, you know, this is like people in a sense, like I remember just starting like Harvest, so like week one. Um, and this question's always persisted, like who are the devs, Anon, oh, it's scary. You know, they could take your money and run. <laughs> I mean, 95% of ICOs failed back like in the 2017 days, right? So all those people that you knew with their fancy websites and sitting in their suits with their pictures on the website, they all took their, mo their your money and ran um, and they weren't Anon, right? So um, this idea that um, being Anon um, is simply negative, you know, is just something we have to dispel. I mean, two, um, 
the largest DAO in existence is ultimately like Bitcoin because nobody knows who Satoshi is and it doesn't even matter anymore. It's just like a random bunch of people who now like shill and talk about Bitcoin. There's no um, centralized organization there in a sense, right? So um, again, a great example of it doesn't matter that nobody knows who he is because it's all in the code, right? That's And that's so the end point of blockchain is this trustlessness, right? Um, so in a sense, like maybe within the first like, you know, six months or whatever, like, oh, you know, what's going on with Harvest? Who are these anonymous guys? But as we've really transitioned to like this full on community who's running everything really day to day and the code that is built and deployed by the developers are on the blockchain. So you can kind of see it and have that trustlessness. Unon doesn't really matter anymore. Right. Um, and I think this has been, in a sense, if you're looking at the dev's answer, it's being anon as an experiment. I think an experiment that's been extremely successful. Um, because as we mentioned through all of this AMA, there's so much cool stuff that the collection of the 10 or 15 of us community members who kind of have like this community manager title, um, who can kind of run the organization on a day to day basis, and then also work with anybody else in the community to help accomplish that, um, you know, that shows you things can be done and it doesn't matter if it's, you know, uh, Stanley Chase Morgan himself or whoever um, running the show secretly behind the scenes at um, Harvest Finance, that person doesn't matter. What matters is us, you know, the community managers, the yeomen, the builders, the gardeners, the cultivators, like we are the guys that are just as important foundational um, cornerstone of this protocol as the developers themselves, right? Um, so obviously I'm not trying to like pat myself in the back or say the community is better or anything more than the developers, but they've allowed this to happen, right? They've handed all this control over purposely um, so their identities don't really matter and they have allowed us to run that show. So, um, you know, so ultimately their identities don't matter. Uh, my identity doesn't matter. JB's identity doesn't matter. What matters is what you can kind of see happening on the blockchain and what you can come in part and be a part of day to day and help make these decisions yourselves. Again, you're making decisions, they aren't. We're the ones that matter in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be my answer to that. Good answer. Anything else, Jim? Um, no, I think I think you answered it perfectly. I mean, right for the people, right? So yep. uh, next question is related to supply and there's been some talk about it in the comments. So let's just go ahead and address that. So the question is, uh, what will happen when the farm token emissions stop? So we're, we have an emission schedule and it lasts for four years. It's 420,069. Um, that is an emission schedule that is on a, I'm gonna do this reverse. Yeah, so it's like this, shit. It's like this, right? That's the emission schedule. So at the beginning, lots of relief, oh my God. At the beginning, lots are released, and then very little is released. What that would do is two things. Firstly, right, that would basically create scarcity. So the less that is able to be released in emissions for rewards, which is going to happen over the next four years, that would mean that there's less adding being added into circulation. So the price of that farm, you know, the price of farm will basically increase at a quicker rate given any continuing market action, right? If the only variable is that there's less being released into the market, then the price will, if it continues, the price will increase at a greater rate. So that's really bullish if you have a long-term positive outlook for Harvest and the farm token. The developers answer to that question, what happens when it does stop, is a very secretive, uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, we have several approaches ready that we will be willing to use. I think that's a big statement. This Basically the statement is, We've got alpha, we're not going to share it with you because it's too, it's too hot. Basically, I think it's the, um, the long short of that. There is a four year schedule on it though, right? But four years is a long time and it's a long way to go for us. You should have a look at the emission schedule, which I think is the second week, uh, one of the second week posts in our medium, talks all about the emission schedule. Uh, and, you know, for example, uh, what's his name? Omar said, Biffy coin has 39,000 coins, right? That is indicative of Biffy being 10 times the price of harvest right now. Okay, so the supply itself isn't important, it's the supply to the price ratio, so the market cap. Farm is actually a fairly low market cap in comparison to what we have been, so we have a lot of growth ahead of us, and together, 
we'll make that growth. All right. Um, final and last question. Um, what are your thoughts on actively managed vaults slash metal vaults? Um, so the devs basically say we see some uh, benefits in this approach. However, the details are still being discussed by our community leaders, Yeoman, and the builders. Um, I, I think ultimately, um, and maybe JP can speak to this um, a little bit more, but like for the managed vaults um, perspective, um, I mentioned earlier, like Uni, Uni V3 um, introduced some like dynamics that people aren't fully um, appreciative yet or really know how to manage appropriately. Uh, and so like we've been working with some of these um, protocols that have stable coins um, like Duet um, and Stakewise, um, I believe, basically to um, deploy multiple vaults where then we can keep an eye on um, the, the price span of these tokens. Because once you um, leave a certain price parameter within these vaults, uh, the vault basically becomes uh, not working on Uniswap until the price ranges uh, reactivate. And so that means um, if you're with those stablecoin projects, you're constantly having to monitor price and you're constantly having to deploy like um, new liquidity pools with new ranges on Uniswap V3 and can come just become something time consuming and pulls you away um, from doing what you want to do with, which is develop. And so here at Harvest Finance, we're kind of offering that service to say, hey, we can run those vaults for you. Uh, we can help you advertise those and just kind of get you some TBL and people seeing um, this product that you have. And you have a good, strong liquidity pool now on Uniswap V3. Um, and then we collect a little bit of revenue stream or whatever the deal that we happen to work out with that individual project. So um, for us or like for me, I specifically see this as something as great um, to be offered out to the greater community. And I don't think the, the greater community ultimately knows this. And so this is why that we have our yeoman and community leaders that go out and find these different places that have stable coins or maybe a new token that just needs to be deployed on Uniswap. Um, and we would definitely love to work with them. For sure. Agreed. Uh, yeah. Any more questions? If there's any more questions coming in the comments, Get them in quick because we're going to end any minute now. Yeah, jumping into general. Did anybody dump a bunch of stuff here? Uh, so Kish has asked if we can share our opinions about various L1 blockchains and any future support. So Solana, Cardano, Polka, Algorand, Cosmos. Uh, that's based entirely on personal opinion. I think the middle three are the back of the list, front and back, uh, the first and last are probably front of the list. Um, would it shoot farm to the moon most probably but there's plenty of other things that will at the same time so it's not all about l1 deployments but that is on the list yeah i, I would just say it goes back to my other answer like we just need to see long-term building sustainability on these chains right like we just don't want to go deploy a whole new basically underlying contract structure to go and deploy you know on um, Arbitrum or, or whatever, whatever that this chain is, right? Just randomly that popped in my head. And then it just be a bunch of like DEXs that are trying to start up and doing yield farming, but then nothing's really sustainable there, right? So once those programs run out, like what else is being built on these chains that we can continuously farm? And I know like there's some Aves and uh, whatever expanding to other chains, but that's one main protocol, right? Like I was saying earlier, everybody's still building on ETH. Right. Like I know there's a little bit of gas issues on ETH and this fluctuates back and forth, but everybody's still building here. Um, and so this is ultimately like where the profitability and the focus is until we see this huge developer shift where people are legitimately building a bunch of viable protocols to actually launch on these other chains. It doesn't really make sense for us to deploy only for these short time liquidity locusting events. So. Cool. Um, All right. Anything else? So, uh, yeah, I think Frank, your question has been noted. Don't worry, we are working on it. Okay, so I understand your point. Uh, it is something you should be careful of because NFTs, especially the ones that we've released, we've made it clear that there is no promise of future uh, kind of yield, but we're working on it. So stay tuned for that. Um, and that's kind of, I think that's it in terms of questions. All right. Awesome, guys. Well, uh, I appreciate you tuning in. We just broke over the, the hour mark here, an hour and 10 minutes. 
Um, but I think it was, we ran over a lot of good stuff. I'll post uh, pretty much like the, the bare basis uh, text of the answers to these questions in Reddit. Obviously, it's not going to have all the commentary that we had to, to kind of deep dive into a little bit. I think this should save on YouTube um, so you can rewatch our beautiful faces all over again. But um, hopefully we can do this here maybe three, six months. And if anybody has a bunch of other burning questions, we can definitely throw those out to the devs again. But um, just really appreciate you guys tuning in and listening us to us knuckleheads talk about uh, Harvest Finance. I'm just going to shout out real quick my podcast channel. It is that one that's just posted in the group chat. Go and wow. do that. Me and, me and Red are going to have a podcast soon, so we're going to do that. There you go. All right, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Please, everybody, come join our community. You can be one of us the next time this podcast sits up here. Um, truly, we want everybody to come help us out. Um, we love everybody's contributions. I'm somebody who's just a community member that's just been here for a long time. So I'm the same as you. Would love to see more of your faces in the chat, volunteering, helping out.